Hello, everybody. Welcome to our second TikTok at EBS University. My name is Sven Henkel. I'm professor for marketing at EBS and also the director of the TIC. For those who, are, who could not attend our first TikTok, the TIC is a new institute aiming to bridge the gap or to bridging the gap between technology, innovation, and customer centricity. So we try to be, and we want to be a platform where, where experts from different fields can really meet and discuss and really getting things forward and really trying to, to make improvements for technology, for the use of technologies and really trying to have a, a massive impact on society. And so we're very happy to having you, to discussing with you. And tonight we have got um, a great uh, guest here uh, at, at, at our TikTok. It's Manfred Tropper. I, 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 just, I already learned we call him Money. <laughs> <laughs> the founder and CEO of Mantro, and he's talking about a very important topic about the humanization of innovation. So he wants to really start a discussion whether it makes more sense or that it doesn't make any sense to have just those procedures and trying to involve and trying to, to plan everything and really taking human beings into consideration, really making use of the creativity and the power of human beings. That's a topic I truly believe in, and so I'm very happy to having you, Manfred. So I think my colleague Tobias Gutmann will give a short introduction. You two know each other for more than, I don't know, five to seven years. So Manfred, welcome to this short session. We're looking forward to your presentation and yeah, good luck, have fun. And to all the others who are attending that talk, feel free to discuss, to ask at any time, I think, especially in the digital age, we have to have very interactive, it should be an interactive, a discussive session that would be great if we could really make an interactive place out of this digital discussion here. Thank you very much for being here. And I would like to hand over to Tobias. Toby, where are you? I can't see you. Ah. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Sven, and good evening, everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome Manfred Mani. Man Manfred is the managing director or the CEO and founder of Mantro. Mantro is a so-called full stack digital company builder. And I think we will, uh, after the next 20 minutes, we will know what this means. Uh, but Mantro partners with kind of established firms, with incumbents to create tailor-made companies and driving digital transformation and new business creation. Uh, the, Funny thing is, it's not a typical consultancy firm. Uh, like uh, there are a lot of companies now out there trying to be agencies or consultancy firms in that um, kind of company building sphere. Uh, but I think Money is uh, and Mantro is kind of a joint venture partner, which also takes over responsibility uh, and risk when they jointly build uh, businesses with uh, very famous companies. I think uh, you will mention some of them. Uh, you are responsible for business development and strategy at Mantro. You also serve as a board member at many companies, and you're also author of the book Vertrauen, like the English word for trust, how your business can benefit from partnerships. And you're also host of the German podcast channel Gewinnwarnung, like profit warning. Uh, so many, many, many different hats. Today, and you're invited to give a short keynote on the humanization of innovation. Um, I'm really looking forward to it. Some logistics uh, for everyone in the call. So we have like a 20 minute keynote from, from Money. Then we do some, uh, I, I do kind of an interview like five to 10 minutes. And then we also open the stage for Q and A. So if you have any questions, feel free to use the chat. I'm looking forward to kind of to talking to every one of you. So Mani, the stage is yours. Uh, I really love that uh, we, we met uh, like six years ago when I was doing research, uh, uh, interviewing you, talking about company building. I love your hands-on approach and especially kind of your straightforwardness when we discuss corporate innovation. So uh, over to you uh, to giving your keynote. So now I should be on unmute and everybody should hear me. <clears throat> Uh, good evening, everybody, um, and thanks for inviting me. Um, yeah, um, as Toby said, we've known each other for quite some year now. And uh, what is funny that, of course, in that time, we also did our journey as a company builder. And 
And as Toby mentioned, we are partnering with established companies. So basically on the other side of the table is always the innovation program, is always the, the strategy department, it are always those guys that think about new business models, new business in general, the, the horizon two, three, 19 stuff and so on. And that's why um, I think I got, I got to know a lot of those programs and um, <clears throat> Yeah, Sven mentioned in the intro that um, I basically say kill all those programs uh, from my experience. And I will just, <clears throat> I want to share some thoughts about that in the, in the next 15 to 20 minutes. So I'm going to share my screen now. Um, I hope you can see it. So if someone could give me a sign if this works. So thank you to me. Yeah, so basically first messages don't believe in the promise of corporate innovation. Um, of course, bold statement, and what does it mean? So maybe just to give you an insight where we are as a company and from, from our personal background, from our experience where we are. Uh, 16 years back, um, we founded Mantro. I personally founded my first company when I was 16 years old and I, did, I was at the end of the 90s. Now the guessing starts how old I actually am. Um, so in the end of the 90s, I was one of those kids that were able to use a keyboard and program a website in HTML4. So the, the very, the, the blinky, blinky button stuff and so on. This was my first company when I was 16 years old. And on the first day of the first semester at TU München, we studied business economics and informatics or computer science, I, I got to know my two co-founders and our first business plan was, okay, it's more fun when we are three people than more one people, one person. Yeah, so that, that was basically the idea. Um, the other thing was that we, we had a product idea back then. We wanted to form a startup, but there was nothing. There was nothing like courses for entrepreneurship. There was no support for founders. The Unternehmertum, uh, which is now I think one of the most famous beacons in, co in innovation in uh, or university innovation somewhere here in Germany. It was <clears throat> later on was one course that I I was visiting as a student, but there was there was actually no support, and so we we basically fell back on this stupid conservative idea that we actually got to earn the money we spent first. And out of that pressure, we founded or we created a service company. So what we did, we went into corporates and built IT software, custom B2B enterprise IT software. And this was actually a quite funny experience because as very young persons, we on the first hand earned shit loads of money because we were able to program. And on the other hand, we, we got to know corporates. Yeah? And we were there at a, at a very special time because we were there as service providers, especially in the time when, the, when the, the rise of digitalization and digital transformation came up. So we were exactly at the part, we were, were doing IT projects. I was doing so very, very interesting stuff like um, transactional secure databases in Basel II confirmed banking systems. This was exactly the thing I was doing, but then digitalization came and then Everybody said, oh, we got to put our B2B enterprise software on iPads because this is digitalization. Yeah, so this, this was the first thing. And so um, what we experienced is that, whoa, everybody is talking about big change, big difference. So they are starting digitalization programs. The labs came up, innovation uh, departments came up, but this were actually IT projects. They were just much more expensive and more consultants were included into the project, but they were actually the same, it was the same part. Because the thing was, nobody was really willing to answer the, the, the bad question. So what's actually really gonna change? How is our business model changing? We were just doing the same shit in new digital software. So um, for ourselves, we said, okay, if you're gonna continue doing that, um, we're basically gonna kill ourselves and everyone around us because this is so, completely dumped. So we were in our end of our 20s um, saying, okay, this is just, we're, we're in comp uh, competition with some large IT companies that call themselves digitalization providers right now. So we got to change something. Hey, looking back, we had a product idea once back then we didn't have money. Hey, now we have money, let's build a product. And then uh, for two or three times, we burned every money we have. So uh, everything was gone because we had no idea how to build product. We, we, got, we were an IT tech company 
that was thinking, hey, we can do software. Why shouldn't we be able to build digital products? We weren't able because we didn't focus on the customer. We didn't put the right question. And most important, we didn't have a structure to build products. We had a structure to build projects. Yeah, we had a structure to act as a service provider. So coming from that experience, we developed ourselves during uh, quite some time. And uh, so we, I think it was six years back when we had the first discussions about that, when you were doing research, the first company builders came up. Um, we had our first venture uh, eight years ago. Then we started the first, first company. So it was really in that time. And we learned company building is the shit. And if you go around now, everybody's talking about, yeah, we're building a company builder. We have an internal company builder. We have an external company builder. We have a company company builder. We're doing, no, it's not a company builder. It's a venture studio. It's basically the same thing. Everybody's asking themselves the question, how can I create an environment where I build new business and I'm not limited by my corporate, current corporate organization? Yeah. And to be honest, we were a very small company, but we were limited by our own organization when we build up product. And I give you one example. We had, of course, we had our consulting projects. We had cool people. Everybody was the same age. We had all the fun in the world. We were, uh, we are actually doing projects and half of the time we were playing Starcrafts in our underwear. So we had all the thing. Yeah. But some of our people were allowed to work in the ventures that we were funding. And the other people had to bitch around basically and prostitute themselves to be in this consulting business. So we had the tension in our very small company that some people were allowed to do cool stuff and other people were not allowed to do cool stuff and they were in the project. So there was the same thing in our small experience. And this is why we developed ourselves more and more into how can we build up something like that? So. Out of the discussions with uh, Professor Dr. Gutmann, um, so there is this, you maybe have seen this, his matrix, um, where he put us in the middle, which is very nice of him, of course. Yeah, so, um, so maybe, but it's, I, I, I still love this thing, even though it's a few years old now, and it's a compression of a lot of work and a lot of talks we had back then, that is, in the end, company building itself, it's not only a financial investment from a corporate perspective. It always has some strategic insight, but it's always about things that are not very clear yet. And I think this is, this is very important to understand that when you're building a new company, a company, a company is something that develops itself and so on. So why should you be able to decide how to manage that upfront? How should you be able to, to find a governance structure up front before you know what you're actually doing? Because it's on the one hand a strategic thing, it's on the one hand a financial thing, it's where it's coming from that's not also very clear. So you have exactly nothing that is defined. Yeah? And now coming back to, um, to corporate innovation environments, what they're actually doing is they try to define everything and they try to align everything. And what when we learned anything in our experience and we have... Uh, right now we have 22 different joint ventures. We sold a bunch of them, um, but you cannot compare Audi to ThyssenKrupp, for example. These are completely different shareholders and also the markets we're acting is completely different. We have different kind of valuations. We have different kind of people working in there. We have different kind of customers working in there. So why should I be able as mantra to say, I, I'm comparing the two investments to one another and I'm benchmarking them on, their, on the same KPIs. This is just not possible. But this is actually what corporate innovation does. Corporate innovation programs, you have like, okay, you have a four week idea concept, then you have a pitch day and then everybody from the board is using, is putting their finest sneakers on and is coming in this very cool, puts the tie away and everybody's like clap, 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 clap. Thank you very much for this great pitch. I'm so happy to do that. I'm one of the bad guys there because I'm coaching those teams and I try to tell them how to pitch in this, in this environment because in the end, everything is the same the people working on the idea are not really working on their idea. They are working on how to satisfy the CEO with a great pitch. They are not thinking about what's the best for my product. They are not thinking about what's the best for maybe also my company that's building up. It's what do I have to do to be able to answer the most questions in two weeks, in one week, tomorrow. 
Uh, and the tension gets higher and higher the more you get to it. It's like writing an exam in university, but actually you're building a company, you're building a business model. And why should this be actually the same thing? Yeah. So um, to oh my, aha, here we go. Um, so what we learned is that in the end, so value chains are changing. Nobody can do it alone, and we need new business and not startups. So when you're talking to corporate innovation, you know we want to be like startups. No, you won't. This won't happen. You're not a startup. You're an established company. You have a process. You want to understand things. You want to have the innovation power of a startup. You don't, trust me, I'm too old for this shit. Nobody wants to be a startup. Me, being a startup means you have no idea how your market works. You have definitely not enough money to work around. And you have the, the craziest people around that want to fulfill their self-fulfilling prophecy of life. This is what you have in a startup. This is not what you want to do. You want to make serious business. But how do you can do that? So what we did, we tried to put that <laughs> into a process, you know, which is kind of a, just a maturity model for business models. Yeah? You're finding an idea, you're validating it, but it never takes the same time. It never takes the same amount. And what we actually learned as Mantro is that our main value is not that we're able to build software. Our main value is not me running around. I tell this business model is good or not that I do a due diligence on that. Our main value is that I find people that are actually willing to put their full life into a venture and to say, I want to punch that idea. And what I'm doing in the partnership is nothing else than playing the bullshit firewall to corporates saying whenever they want to say, ah, I want this KPI and I, want, I need the balance sheet of last year right now, they have to talk to me instead of the founders. That's my full role because I can say, hey, I'm also a shareholder, talk to me first and I don't want it. I want the team to focus on the thing and focus on the business model, focus on the development of the business, focus on the development of the product, make the best decisions. And the, the thing I learned is in every hour portfolio companies, Whenever you're not putting the human in the middle, where you're not saying so, I'm my my company is nothing more than a, as a platform of opportunity for people to come in and to actually build something. And my company is basically only needed because corporates are too dumb to do that, because corporates see humans as resources, corporates see humans as replaceable. Yeah, so whenever you define a process, you say, or a program, it's not important who is in there as long as the right amount of people is running through the program and the process. So, and this is basically the, the difference. I don't count how many people I have in Montreal. I say how many, how many ventures we're actually pushing. And sometimes there are two people in there. Sometimes there are five people in there. It's depending on, do I have the right combination of people working to do so? And so um, that's why I wrote this book. Toby mentioned it. It's about this trust thing. Yeah? And if you're looking at corporate organizations and basically the, the optimization efficiency, optimization times we had in the past, I don't know, 20 years. So business economics or 30 years, McKinsey, BCG, and so on. They actually were working around and made companies more and more efficient. They dehumanized everything. So there is no trust in an organization. There is just no trust between colleagues. How should someone that comes in and he knows that my, my next step is just the next presentation and so on. I don't, I don't trust my colleagues. How should I trust the organization that they support me in doing something right? Yeah, so, and so that's why um, basically I think corporate innovation programs are doomed to die. And, and you see that on the market. So there is a new lab and the labs are down. So there is a new program, there is a new accelerator, three years later, things are down, yeah? Because, and that's a, the basic hypothesis around it. So when you look at, I don't know, whatever, um, uh, to give you a number. So the average time a software as a service startup takes to actually take off and to have a kind of a, a good growth and revenues that are maybe after break even is seven years. The average time of corporate venture capital funds to exist is four and a half years. 
So normally, nearly every corporate venture capital fund is killed after four and a half years when the average time of for a company to grow into a state to be relevant takes seven years. So whenever a program is designed to look at the KPIs every year, is to look at what is happening there and so on and so on, it's basically not giving people time to work in the environment because it's you're not looking at the people working. Did, did they do something better? Did they grow? Did they create new solutions or whatever? No, you are looking at, do I have relevant uh, revenue in comparison to uh, car sales? We talked about that we have, for example, we are working together with, with Audi. The department we're ex working together closely with the people that know business model, they, they understand that a month by month growth of 25% is something good. The, uh, the treasury department of Volkswagen in, in Wolfsburg looking at the sheer amount of revenue after two years says, let's kill this. This is not working out. Yeah, so now the innovation program even has the pressure from the corporate to basically kill us. So th there are people working on that, but their own organization doesn't want to, to, make, to be better, to grow. Yeah, so... Um, from a corporate, looking from a, from a corporate perspective, yeah, so I try to sum up and I'm really rushing through the slides here. So sorry for that, but let's, let's use the discussion afterwards. So the thing is, um, every, everything that happens in an, in, a, in an accelerator program, in a corporate environment, program, people, corporates need to understand that it's not their business they're creating. It's not the next business unit of the corporate creating. It's the joint venture, however you design it legally between the people working on it and the corporate providing the infrastructure. The corporate in this case is only an infrastructure provider for people to build something. Honestly, it won't hurt. It won't hurt to trust people. You're doing that in your private life. You're doing that nearly everywhere. It won't hurt to give people some space and say, okay, come on, I give you some, some leverage, let's do this. It, it never hurt, it never hurts. As you, can, you might have a business that doesn't work out. Honestly, every investment we got, I think the corporates we're working together with spend more for pence a year that they invest in one of our ventures. Yeah, so that's, it's not like, it's not like it's, it's just billions that we're spending here. So when you're starting an environment, you're trusting people, it's not so expensive and it won't hurt. You only get loyal people that are really interested in the business and in you. And it's a long-term game. Don't kill it after two years. Neither the program nor the, the things that come out of the process. You cannot kill something after two years. And it's never about the program. It's all about the people that are interested in the program. And I think... That's one important thing. If you're talking to uh, corporate employees running through an innovation program, I bet if you talk to them honestly, 70 to 80% will say it's good to have been part of the innovation program for the resume. Nobody goes there to build a business. Everybody says it's cool to have done a design thinking workshop in the, in the cool accelerator. I need the buzzword in my, in my resume. And this is, this is not why there should be a program. It should be the real, this is the highway in your career path. If you're going there, wherever you are, you're allowed to build a business. And if you are the best person to grow this thing, you're allowed to do so in this environment. And none of you knows anything. You have no idea if a business is good or not, especially not if you're a corporate manager, you need other people to do so. And uh, since you know nothing, trust the people that are actually working in the market. Yeah, and so there's basically the mantra of Mantro. Haha, uh -huh. great joke. Um, so there's a huge difference between a project and a company. Projects have an end. So never, never say that an idea running through a corporate accelerator through an innovation program is basically a project. Because what you want to build, if you build new business, you want to have something that is as sustainable as a new company. I want to be like a startup. A startup is a company. Yeah? A startup is something that can grow and live independently, no matter if there is a corporate environment or not. So don't behave like it's projects. Behave like it's a new company and a company needs to grow, a company needs to change, and a company. So the only bad outcome of a company is a company that ends. 
So in the other way, whenever it evolves into the next stage, it's like it's like the name says, it's evolvement. It's getting better. It's get, changing. It's changing all the time. This is what a company does. Everybody is looking at you all the time. Remember that if you're running those, if you're running this project. So no matter if you are the program lead, everybody will say to you, where's your output? When can we see, when we can see numbers? When, where's the revenue? Yeah. If you are the person running through the thing, everybody is looking at you because you're the show pony. You're the cool person that runs around and has a cool idea. This is what, you're, what you want to do. So um, in the end, that's the presentation. Um, I hope there was a, this, this, this run through was fast enough. Um, I hope you could take something away and I'm really looking forward to the discussion. Please ask me um, and please be, be very active in the discussion. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Mani. Uh, I know I could ask hundreds of questions. Uh, let's limit it to some questions and uh, really switch on to the open Q&A. Uh, for those of you in the talk who know me, they all know I'm fascinated, maybe even obsessed with corporate innovation programs. Um, and Mani, we had a lot of talks about that. Uh, you also had a lot of provocative statements, uh, which we could argue and which we could discuss today. <laughs> Uh, but uh, you talked about company builders uh, and there are many also for the audience there are many different names you know there's company builders venture builders startup studios whatever uh, you name it can you just briefly define or explain it what is it that you do what is mantra what is a company builder um there's a the middle long answer to that. Okay, so, <laughs> uh, so the very short version is we're founding to really together new companies uh, together in a, in a partnership, no matter if it's a, with a person, with another company and so on. Because what I totally believe in is that um, what this age of digitalization basically does is that all the value chains are exploding, imploding, you call it, and you need so many skills that no entity itself can have along the way. Yeah, so this is also what you're looking at, at classical founder teams. You're saying, okay, you need different types of people that have skills that in combination actually work great to solve a problem. And I think it's the same thing when you're saying about corporate innovation, if you're working together as a small company, as a company builder and a large corporate, it's basically that two parties bring in their skills. Yeah, so um, what I learned through the year is, um, and that's maybe also the, yeah, so where, where definitions on company building, especially in the corporate space, really differs from one another, is that most of the, the companies out there, most of the company builders out there actually define themselves as very good engineers in all spaces. So they're able to build a product. They are totally capable of doing every of using every method right. Yeah, they are totally capable of doing a market study, doing an MVP, testing something. What I learned is, and that's the most important thing, as a company builder, you build a company, and again, a company consists of people. Yeah, so in the early stages, what we're doing is we're getting people to actually being allowed to find the best solution. When we found the best solution, we have enough experience to design the best organization for that thing. And then we help to build up this organization. And what we see ourselves, you, you see in our offices, Toby, and so on, we basically see this as a kind of an ecosystem where the ventures are kept very, very long in these offices. Yeah, of course, not now it's because nobody is in the office, right? So, but um, the thing is, when, when young companies, and I, I really absolutely don't use the term startup for our ventures, yeah? but when young companies, young businesses come together, they can actually help each other. And with us being, connect, uh, being the connector as a shareholder, we're helping them to actually build up organizations. And that's, that's what a company builder in general really means. So in the early stages, of course, bringing in skills, bringing in infrastructure, having services in place, know how to use a credit card to start a Facebook campaign and so on. But this is the agency part. Yeah? But the most important part is really to help the people in the venture to set up a real organization, to build a growing organism. And this is what a company builder is for me. Mm -hmm. 
So it's about creating new business and you already stressed kind of this people aspect very hard. Uh, the interesting aspect when I talk to corporates and also when I come from research uh, where we say there are actually like four different aspects you need for like we call it venture emergence. You know, there's the hard facts and the soft facts. Hard facts, it means you need, need a process for new venture creation. You need the right organizations to build the right ventures. And then the soft facts, which you stress a lot, is this, what are the individuals, the people who actually build a business and how can you set up that environment that those individuals can thrive and can innovate? Can you like, explain to us like the nuts and bolts, like the hard and soft facts or like the do's and don'ts of uh, company building? Well, in the end, again, as usual, when you're doing something for quite some years in the beginning, we also started out, yeah, we need to process. Yeah, of course, we, uh, we need some structure. We looked at how, how, how are venture capitalists behaving? How are they evaluating business? What are the typical stage gates between a seed, late seed, series A, B, C, et cetera? How, how, how mature has a business model to be to get to the next stage? I think that's, that's what you have on the hard fact side. Yeah, so um, again, what I learned is that non, no business is there and I'm looking at how mature is a business model. And I think this, this is what you can do on a hard fact side. But what I experienced most, and this is really, um, there is really no difference between the, the venture capital world and the corporate world, to be honest, is um, the discussion that gets or is, is happening just not enough is what's the scenario where everybody involved wins? Really? So what, when does the corporate investor win? When does the team win? When does the venture builder win? And then honestly say what you're thinking. And what, what I experienced a lot is that or most of my personal work <laughs> is honestly helping our corporate partners to find out what they actually want. Because you have a highlight strategy, you see, hey, I want to be in this market segment in the next five years, I want to have that part of revenue and so on. But what is it you actually want? Is this for you, is this a strategic thing? Do you just want to have that as a sales channel? Do you just want to have that for marketing reasons, which is totally cool for me, yeah? as long as we know it. Yeah? And if you don't know what you want on a shareholder level, which is then the corporate and mantra, how can you basically tell the people working in that environment what they're doing it for? Of course, you have those, those marketing blah, blah stuff like, hey, yeah, it's a vision and my vision, mission, whatever statement, yeah? So, but in the end, and that's, that's, a, that's a, just the economical fact, yeah? A company is existing to make the shareholders richer. That's what it's for, yeah? So, and or to give them any reason to continue and to further invest in the company. It might be a strategic reason, might be an access to a market I wouldn't have before or something like that. So, and if this is not really defined first, yeah, how can you give people a playground to work in? And I think that's, that's, that's so important. So that's why I, I don't think about soft fact, hard facts or whatever. Yeah? In the end, it's very simple. When you build something new, you got to define what's the best case end game is. And if this is clear and everybody really agrees on that and there is no hidden agenda on one side and whatever. Um, so then you can actually build up something where you can really leverage the soft facts and tell people, I want to get there. And I really believe you are the person to get me there. Yeah, but if, you, if you're having the, the, the goal unclear, and you don't talk about it and everybody is like, hey, we're completely equal, but I'm 51% equal. And um, if this is the basis of your collaboration, yeah, if you're never eye to eye, you will never allow people to actually be at their best performance. Yeah. So one last question before we go uh, to the, the questions from the audience, which I already saw in the chat. So please use the chat. Uh, but before we, yeah, we are business school, there are a lot of students also here and they will uh, watch the video. What kind of advice can you give uh, the students, especially for you as a university dropout, <laughs> uh, kind of <laughs> and successful in kind of in the venture world? Which, which advice can you give our students? So first of all, what I tell, what I would tell my kids, finish your studies. <laughs> so it's, it's much better and it's especially much easier when you talk to your parents if you've finished your studies i can tell that from experience never tell your parents you can stop university this is not a very good experience um now to be honest i think um 
know your worth. That's that's the basis. So your every type of organization we have right now, we are and again, this was like nearly 20 years back when I started my studies and so on, and this was still and at TU, they were already in this, we're kind of an elite school and we're so cool and whatever. Yeah, so this was the talk um, Ann-Kathrin uh, gave us on the first day that we, I was uh, Achleitner, Ann-Kathrin Achleitner, she, she told us, hey, you're from TU, yeah, so this is something great. And so we were really, we were instructed to be cool. Yeah, so this, this is what, what happened back then. But still, for me, I found out that whenever you're looking at organizations that are designed to be dehumanized, to be very efficient. So it's just not important who you are. Yeah? But if you actually uh, assimilate into that structure and think about, uh, okay, it's just my next job and I just gotta, I just gotta live by the process and I just gotta fulfill my thing, you're actually worth nothing because you don't believe you're worth anything. And this doesn't mean to be for you to be arrogant to say I know everything better. This is something different, but just say okay, if I'm really putting all in, I need to find an environment that actually lets me put all in and where I have effect. And if this doesn't happen, if you go out of university, and now I'm talking not to the to the to the gray-haired uh, professors here, <laughs> so if you go dropping out of university, you're in your prime. You will never be able to work that much again in your life. You will never be able to, to know that much and have your, your capabilities at, at that level uh, with that age. Honestly, I'm at the end of my 30s and I feel that I'm not as powerful as I've been 10 years ago. Yeah, so you're in your prime. So it, when you want to change something, when you want to be really important, find the environment where your skills, your performance is actually really valued and then put in everything because otherwise you will just be one of millions. All right. Thank you, Mani. Rep talk and yeah. we will stop the recording now.